You know, I am so excited to be back inside of this space. Do you realize where I am? I am inside of Thomas Jefferson Middle School. We have not been inside of this space in 16 months. That's 67 weeks of doing services outside of this space. And today, we get to be back inside, in person at 9.30 and 11 for live services. Now, obviously, this service is not live. This is pre-recorded. But as you watch, just know that a whole bunch of people will be gathering inside of this space for in-person services. And I just want to invite you, if you live in the area, please join us. There is nothing like being together again. I just want to encourage you to come out for that starting this Sunday and every single Sunday. Well, the other thing I'm excited about is today we are starting a brand new series called The Power of Words, where we're talking about how to be effective communicators. I remember the fir my first day of middle school, man, I heard some powerful words. I remember I got on the bus as a fifth grader and, um, and I sat down and there was a kid across from me and he noticed the sweet kicks that I was wearing. I was rocking my favorite pair of Velcro shoes, man. Those things were great because you didn't have to tie the laces. Well, he saw those things and he looked at me and he said, hey, is this your first day? And I said, yeah. He said, man, I gotta tell you, you can't wear those shoes to middle school. I said, what? He said, yeah, you'll get suspended. Man, you talk about powerful words. I completely freaked out. I couldn't believe what he was saying to me. And then for the rest of that bus ride, I was just paralyzed with fear thinking I was gonna get suspended. Words are so powerful. You know, the Bible talks a lot about the power of words, especially in the wisdom book of Proverbs. In Proverbs 12, 18, it says, the words of the reckless pierce like swords. Man, sitting on that bus, first day of middle school, I felt like I'd been pierced by a sword thinking about, I'm gonna get suspended. But then the rest of the proverb says, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And fortunately, just as I was getting off the bus, I turned to someone who had a wise tongue and she said, no, you're not going to get suspended. Man, that brought so much healing to me. Although that was the last day that I ever wore Velcro shoes to school. Proverbs 15, four says, the soothing tongue is a tree of life but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Maybe you can remember a time where your spirit was crushed by the words that somebody said to you. Proverbs 18, 21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death. You know, that verse I think is, is for me why communication is so incredibly complicated because the tongue does have the power of life and death. You know, one minute we're having this great conversation. It's life-giving. It's amazing. And then the next minute with sometimes one single word that is spoken, it's like death has just reigned over that conversation. Sometimes the entire relationship. So today, what we want to talk about is how do we avoid miscommunication? You know, I read recently that in the workplace, 90% of all management problems really come down to miscommunication. I thought, man, that is so true. And how true is that also of marriage? Like what percentage of marriage problems really just come down to miscommunication? What percentage of family drama really just comes down to miscommunication? See, if we can harness the power of our words, we can revolutionize the way we communicate. And in turn, we can revolutionize our relationships. So for the next four weeks, we're going to talk about the harnessing the power of our words. And today we are going to lock in on one verse, Ephesians 4.29. If there's only one verse in the entire Bible that you could commit to memory and you could really apply to all of your relationships and how you communicate, this is the verse.
The Apostle Paul begins Ephesians 4.29 with these words. He says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Now, when I hear those words, unwholesome talk, I immediately think about a middle school cafeteria. You know, maybe you can remember sitting around a table just like this one and you heard words that you'd never heard before. You heard dirty jokes, you heard inappropriate things, um, you, heard, you heard cuss words, you heard all kinds of unwholesome talk. And maybe that's what comes to mind when you first hear this verse. But actually, what Paul is trying to communicate to us is something much, much bigger than just you know some, some cuss words or some inappropriate talk. The standard that Paul is setting is so much higher. When you look at the original Greek language, you see that the word unwholesome is the Greek word sopros. And sopros is this very unique Greek word because it can be translated two very different ways. It can mean using words that are harmful, but it can also mean using words that are useless which it's really helpful when we realize that there's those two separate words, harmful or useless, because what Paul says next makes a lot of sense. He says, but instead only use what is helpful for building others up. So he's contrasting these different words, he's saying, you know, don't use harmful words, instead use helpful words. Don't use useless words, but use words that are useful for doing something, for building others up. And so what Paul is really warning us against is two types of words. He's saying, don't use words that are unhelpful and don't use words that are unhealthful. And yes, I did just make up that word unhealthful, but you know what I'm talking about when I say unhealthful. Unhealthful words are words, they're just not healthy. They're coming from a bad place. In fact, the second that they come out of your mouth, you know that they're unhealthful words. And we're gonna talk about those kind of words a little bit later on in this series. But today, I wanna talk about words that are unhelpful. Because you see, it's our unhelpful words where most of our miscommunication comes from. Because most of the time, we're coming from a good place when we speak, right? We, we have good intentions, but somehow we have poor execution. And the words that come out of our mouths, they just end up being quite unhelpful. And they lead us to a lot of problems with our communication. Come on, I want to show you something. Well, something about being in a cafeteria just makes me hungry. <laughs> I love extra virgin olive oil, man. I love the way it tastes. I love its unique flavor. I love the health benefits of olive oil. And I love the fact that it's from the Mediterranean region where Jesus lived, where he walked. Something about having olive oil just makes me feel closer to Jesus. The other thing that I love is buying big containers to get that nice discount on my olive oil. But one of the things about a big container is that it's just not practical. You want to drizzle a little olive oil onto pasta or some bread. It just doesn't work. So I have this nice little bottle with this great little easy pour spout and uh, it works perfectly. But it often needs to be refilled. And for whatever reason, in my family, nobody seems to ever refill the olive oil bottle. So that task ends up falling to me. Now, the fact that I'm getting ready to pour this olive oil and I'm coming from a good place, I'm wanting to be helpful. I have good intentions about pouring my olive oil into this little bottle. That's not enough, is it? right? I have to be careful when I pour because if I just kind of pour any old way, check out what happens. I'm getting a lot in there, but the reality is there's a lot of olive oil that is getting spilled. There's a lot that ends up being useless. And quite frankly, I got a big mess here. Although mm, that is delicious. Now it's the same thing we think about our words. When, when we want to pour words into other people, even when we're coming from a good place, you know, when you're trying to say words that are helpful to build others up, you can't just pour in your words any old way. You have to be careful with the words that you use, or you find that a lot of the words end up being useless or at times even making a big mess. But what Paul says next in this verse is so helpful. He says, you're only supposed to speak words that are helpful for building others up, but check this out, according to their needs. Now, 
That's not why we speak. We don't speak according to other people's needs, do we? I mean, I know why I speak. I speak because I have something to say. I speak because I have words that I want to get out. I have to be heard. See, we don't speak according to the needs of others. We speak according to our own needs. You see, when we speak unhelpful words, it's not because we're coming from a bad place. It's just that we're using words that are natural to us. They resonate with us. We think, you know what? This will be helpful to me, so I'm going to share it with somebody else. But what's helpful to you, and you know this, isn't necessarily helpful to your spouse or to your friend or to your colleague. You see, it's not enough for us to want to use words that are helpful and words that build others up. We have to use words that are according to the needs of the other person. Now, how do we do that? How do we speak according to someone else's needs? Well, let me tell you. Two years ago, we did a sermon series called, I Said This, You Heard That. And we looked at something called temperaments. Now, these are different from personality types like Myers-Briggs and the DISC profile because unlike personality types, which can change over time based on your life experience, temperaments are how God has innately wired us. And temperaments impact the words that you say. They also impact the words that you hear. Temperaments tell us a lot about the core needs of a human being. So um, some of you saw this video a couple of years ago, but I, I want to show it to you again. It, it really kind of gives a quick overview of the four temperaments. Why don't you see if you can identify which temperament you are? Well, hopefully that video gave you a sense of which temperament you are. Uh, Let me just give you a quick overview of these temperaments. So for those who are yellow, you are a sanguine. And um, sanguines speak the language of people and fun. They bring the party. For for those reds, the cholerics, they speak the language of power and control. They're the reason that things get done in this world. Greens, the phlegmatics, speak the language of calm and harmony. Greens are the peacekeepers of the world. And then finally, blues, melancholics, they speak the language of perfection and order. I thank God that we have blues in this world. Now, reds and yellows are our extroverts, and greens and blues are introverts. And yellows and greens tend to be more people-oriented, and reds and blues are more task-oriented. Now, what you need to understand is no matter which one of these temperaments you are, no one is better than another. Each one of them has unique strengths and unique weaknesses. But, you know, the thing that we all have in common, no matter the temperament, is that we all have the tendency to speak according to our own needs rather than the needs of others. And here's how that can be damaging if we're not careful. 
Ben, you forgot to bring the trash can up again. Oh, sorry. I was just I about to... I don't see why it's so hard for you to remember. You have to bring it up every single Tuesday. What, did you walk right past it? Come on, you don't even have that many... What is this? I was just, uh, drawing something. Well, clean it up. I will. No, don't just say you're gonna clean it up. Do it. Just, let me just finish. Let me just finish. Wait, that's my car. You can draw when you're finished with your chores. Right now it's not time to play, it's time to work. Do what I asked you to do first. Oh, come on. Listen, there's no need to cry. There's just a right way to do things. Now, do you want to do things your way, or do you want to do things the right way? The right way, I guess. All right. Now get this cleaned up. Now! Hey, are you all done? What's wrong? Did he show you the comic book he was making you for your birthday? I think it was supposed to be a surprise. What he knows he's supposed to do is chores first. Oh, Dad! Dad, do you want to play my game? Uh, you know, I just have so much work to do right now, bud. I uh, just really don't have time to play chess, okay? It will only take five minutes, come on. I know chess. A good game can go on for hours. No, no, it's not chess. I completely, I completely made up my own rules. Come on. Uh, why would you want to make up your own rules? I mean, chess is a great game. Look, uh, the instructions are right here. Just, just look at that. Get you there. No, but Dad, I'm, I made up the entire game from scratch. Just let me show you how to play, okay? Look, chess has been around for a thousand years, okay? Now there's a strategy and order. Changing the rules defeats the whole purpose of the game. Look, I'm gonna show you how to play really quickly, but then I have to work, okay? All right, first of all, I don't need Wait, these. Wait, what, what are you doing with those? No, don't throw them away! It's just a bunch of paper, bud. You need to learn how to play the real game. Oh, and those? Are you kidding me? Uh, uh, let's see, yeah, these aren't set up right. And I worked on those! And! Uh, that was so hard! Look, this is a rook, okay? It moves forward or backward. Never diagonal. Are you listening? Uh, this this isn't. Uh, this isn't very fun. Well, we haven't even started yet. <laughs> I know it's just that regular chess. It, it it's so boring, and I, I liked my way better. Okay. Well, you can't just make up your own rules. I mean, there's just a right way to do things in a right order. Now, do you want to do things your way or the right way? <sighs> Right way, I guess. Right way, right way. All right, now this is called a knight. Hey, now we got it. Grab your stuff. We don't want to be late. What? You're leaving already? Yeah, we've got. I've got to go to summer camp. We've got an hour's drive ahead of us. <sighs> How many times did you play his game? Isn't it so much fun? He's been working all day on it. Okay, say goodbye. Bye, bud. Now, I'm not trying to beat up on dads or anybody who's task oriented, but the reason that that video is so important is because our words have a massive impact on other people. And the truth is your temperament determines the words that you speak. Now, if you're sitting here and you're going, you know, Derek, I was hoping for more of a sermon and less of like a self-help talk. Let me just speak to you specifically for a minute. So Jesus said in John 13, 34, he said these famous words, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you had to find one verse that sums up all of Christianity, the whole Christian life in one verse, this is it. Jesus says, as I have loved you, right? Jesus loves us unconditionally, sacrificially. He laid down his life for us, okay? 
He says, you are to love that same way to other people, selflessly, sacrificially, unconditionally. That is the Christian life. Now, that seems simple enough, doesn't it? Just love everybody. But we all know that you can't love everybody the same way. So there's the rub. That's why sometimes we've got to get practical about how do we love people the right way, the way that's going to work for them. You know, my wife, Becky, and I just celebrated 19 years of marriage. And um, one of the things that we did early on in our marriage was we learned about a, a book by Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages, famous, famous relationship book. It basically goes through these five love languages. They're words of affirmation, acts of service, um, giving and receiving gifts, quality time, and physical touch. And you primarily express your love to one another through one of those five gifts. Well, what was fascinating to me was I realized that my primary love language is words of affirmation. And so I had been heaping all of these words of affirmation onto my wife to try and love her the way that Jesus loves me. But what was fascinating is that that wasn't my wife's primary form of, of the way she's loved. And so, you know, we'd be standing in the kitchen, for example, and, and I would just be showering her with these words of how great she is. And in her mind, she would be thinking, you know, I already know that I'm great. <laughs> But are you going to stand there next to that dishwasher or are you going to unload it? <laughs> you know, because I wasn't speaking words that were according to her needs, according to her love language. You know, if we are really going to be serious about loving people the way that Jesus loves us, if we're really going to be serious about speaking words that are helpful, that build others up according to their needs, not our needs, we have to fundamentally understand how other people are wired. We have to fundamentally understand the needs of others so we can love them well and so we can speak words that are actually helpful to them. So I want to share with you a link to this assessment of these temperaments, okay? Now, normally, these assessments cost $11.99 each, but we actually negotiated a special rate with the creator of these assessments. And then we decided, you know what? Let's just go ahead and prepay for a whole bunch of them. We we said, you know, we just want to make this available to every single person at Grace. And so they will be available for a limited time, only as long as this series is going on, or I guess until we run out of assessments, but here's the deal. These assessments, they're, they're quick, they're easy, and after you take them, you will get a customized report which will help you understand better these different, um, these different temperaments, and it will also give you a customized report of your specific wiring and your needs and how you communicate and need to be communicated to. And I want to share with you one other resource I'm super, super excited about. So a week from this Thursday, that's Thursday, July 22nd at 8 p.m., we are inviting Kathleen Edelman, who's the creator of I Said This, You Heard That. She is going to join us online over Zoom for a talk. It's called 60 Minutes to Better Communication. And then if you like this kind of stuff, or maybe you know someone who will really enjoy diving into these temperaments, you need to invite them to be a part of this. So you can see the link there to, to get more information, to register. We would love to have you there. There, but also make sure you take that online assessment. Do that today. All right. Now, just in case one more time you're thinking, now Derek, why, why in the world are we, are we doing all this? Okay. Let me just tell you, one of the most spiritual things that you can do in your life is to better understand how God made you. That there's nothing more spiritual than being able to be more in tune with how God has wired you. And subsequently, the more that you can understand about how God has made other people and how God has wired them, man, that is so incredibly important, such an amazing spiritual exercise. Now, I want to show you one more thing. Come on. So, when you're trying to pour words into people that are helpful, that build them up, you, we've already established that you've got to be careful with how you do that. And you see, you need something so that you're not just 
pouring and, and making a big mess. And when you can understand how people are wired, when, when you have something that, that gives you kind of a foothold into understanding uh, people's core needs, all of a sudden it funnels your words. It, it helps you to land those words right. So you don't have any issues with unhelpful words. You don't have any issues with harmful words. You, you don't have a mess because now you have a tool to help you to love people the way Jesus loves you. Now, I am a green blue and my wife Becky is a yellow red. And um, we've discovered through these temperaments a few words that I can use, three words specifically, that just are, are so helpful. They build her up. And those three words are, let's do it. Let's do it. You see, my wife, uh, she speaks the language of people and fun. And so oftentimes she'll throw out an idea, man. And it's, it always has to do with people and fun. Now it isn't always fleshed out to the same level of detail that, that I would like. And so oftentimes I start thinking about, okay, well, let's talk about what's involved. How much is this going to cost? And then let's see, how can we make it so it's even better? And, and those aren't necessarily bad things, but, but when, when I ask too many questions and the process takes so long, there are times when the moment is gone and we no longer have that opportunity for whatever that was. And so what I have realized is that the three words that I can speak to my wife when, man, I already know this is a pretty good idea. And yeah, we don't have all the details, but we know enough to know this is going to be great. We'll figure it out on the way. I need to say to her, let's do it. Yes, let's do it. And when I do that, man, those are three words that are so helpful. They build her up. And they're so much better than so many other words that I speak from my green, blue wiring that I think are going to be helpful. They're actually not. So here's the deal. You, you want to speak helpful words. You want your words to build others up. What I encourage you to do is to take this temperament assessment. Do it right now. And then I will see you right back here next week, or actually even better, maybe I'll see you in person for in-person services at 9.30 and 11, right here at TJ Middle School. And we'll pick it up right here as we continue this series, The Power of Words. Let me pray for you. God, um, we do, we want to use words that are helpful, that build others up. But Lord, please help us to understand how people are wired. Help us through, through this tool, these, these temperaments, to better love people the way you love us. God, we want to speak words according to the needs of others. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.